You are listening to Magic of Endings Part 2 authored by Tom Avery and narrated to you by Audiobooks with Keeper of Lost Stories. For more such audiobooks, do not forget to hit like on this video and subscribe to this channel. Thank you. Memories of the Sand Rico shouted Jojo, launching himself forward. He meant to throw a hand out to grab at Rico, to grasp his fast disappearing foot. But that lunge became another flap and another flap and before he knew it, Jojo too was headed for the open window and the summer sky beyond. Look at me, Jojo, Rico squealed. I'm flying, I'm flying. And he was. He really was. He was three meters off the ground and rising, flapping great long winds of white and brown, each sweep of them propelling him forward. Jojo spun back toward the bungalow, twisting his own wings. If mum looked out now, no, the bathroom blind was down, but he could hear her. Boys, burp, boys, are you a oh, burp, okay? What's going, burp? Jojo gulped, still flapping his wings that kept him hovering. He glanced over his shoulder at his disappearing brother. He looked back to his own window where a tiny lady with gray hair, huge gold earrings and a pirate hat was grinning out at him. What could he do? We are just, we are just popping out, mom, he shouted. Just gonna get some fresh air. Hang, burp, on, his mom called. He looked back to Rico. He was tiny now, a little action figure of a boy. Suspended in the sky, he couldn't just hang on, so he didn't. By some magic, Jojo did not just have things. He knew how to use them. He turned and flapped and like that he was away. A big sweeping burst and he had taken on to the skies, up, up and away. Rico was some distance ahead, not just flapping but swooping, diving downwards before catching himself and soaring up again, up and up. Rico, Jojo called, his larger, more powerful wings, pushing him toward his brother. The air was not as it had always been, Simply the space around him, it was now, to his wings, solid. It was a staircase on which he could place his winged arms and propel himself forward. Except when it was water, through which he could swim, he could glide. He was a bird, a speeding eagle. He was born to fly. Jojo could not help himself. As his brother turned to see him, he let out a cry of joy and exhilaration. Woohoo! Yeah, shouted Rico in reply. We are flying. We are flying, shouted Jojo. We are flying. All thought of going after his little brother to bring him back home was gone. Now his heart was set on flying, on plunging through the white street, blue beyond. Come on, Jojo caught up to his brother and now tagged him and overtook him. You are it, Jojo shouted. Then he flew, beating and gliding, Twirling and spinning, Rico laughed and laughed and flapped after him. Come on, bud, he called after him, then waited till his laughing, soaring brother had him. Eat, screamed Rico and tore off and up across the sky. A flap and swoop and Jojo was after him, joining him in laughing and screaming and on they went. If you'd looked up then, from the fields and tracks below, you would have seen them, high up as two birds darting and driving, reveling in the summer sun. Something did look up, a lot some things. A colony of tiny creatures, which seeing the fun that was, and had only halfway gotten there, when the game stopped. Look, look, said Rico, between laughs and gasps. He was above Jojo. Higher and higher Rico had gone, and he was pointing down now. Jojo letting the game fall from his arms and a last chuckle cuff out from his throat followed his brother's finger. All the world was let out below them. The cottage and the lane was behind, hills to the left, the village of Door, little toy cottages and shops and the train station to the right. Jojo remembered, 
somewhere in his head that he was afraid of heights. He remembered that fear but he felt none then. The wings made him fearless. Out in front of them, where Rico pointed, was the sea, bluer than the sky, a great flat pond of blue, only broken by the arc of stone which gave Dor its name. It protruded out from the cliffs that bordered the village, hugged the beach at one end, vaulted over the waves. The door of Dor, that's where Rico pointed, the sea. The sun glinted off gentle ripples. Amazing, Jojo called up to his brother. Rico was higher now, higher and higher. Jojo looked back down to the blue and the beach. The sand swept a long curve beyond the dunes. They never went there, not to the beach. Jojo realized as he looked at the great sweeping expanse that he did not know why. They went to the town and the hills, to the park, the river, and along to the famous fairy mounds. But neither Grandad and Grandma nor Mum would take them to the beach. The beach, it was a misty fog of lost memory, that place, and now it was as clear a picture as any place could ever be. Jojo could make out small sails out on the crystalline pond. He could pick out individual children with buckets and spades on the sand. His eyes became fixed, not on anything he saw there now, but on some moment of memory that appeared before him. His dad, he was sure it was him. Jojo flapped his wings, hovering, trying to focus on that man dancing in his mind. Rico whooped, a long way up now, higher and higher. What Jojo saw was the man he saw, just his back, a tall, broad man. He blocked out the setting sun as Jojo sat on the sand. The man was a dark shadow against the light. Jojo could see his floppy wet hair, like a mop on his head. He watched him bend and pick up a stone. Then he turned. There was no face he could see. He was just black shadow. But Jojo knew that his father was looking right at him. Come on, buddy, said the memory dad. I'll teach you how. Buddy. That's what he called Rico. And now he knew why. Now he knew. A feather spiraled past Jojo's face. But he did not move. Apart from his flapping wings, he hovered, letting the memory flutter past him. He saw it all now, his dad teaching him to skim stones on that very beach, his dad's beach. Maybe that's why they didn't go there. He remembered skimming his first stone. He remembered his dad picking up and flying him around the beach. Another feather passed him, scudding back and forth through the air. Buddy, he heard his father's voice again. Buddy, you did it! His dad made him fly. Another feather. Buddy. Feather. Feather. Jojo shook himself out of the memory and looked around at the blue sky. It was not just a few feathers. There were tens of them, maybe a hundred, spiraling and dipping and fluttering down out of the clear. Buddy, Rico! Jojo wasted not a moment longer. Rico! he shouted and beat his wings as hard as ever. Beat and beat and shot like an arrow upwards, searching the sky for his brother. He saw him then, higher than he could have imagined. Another silhouette against another sun. It blazed orange and red behind Rico as he continued to fly upward, up and up, higher and higher. Rico! Jojo screamed. Rico! But scream as he did, up his brother went. As feathers continued to rain down, surely Rico could hear him, Jojo thought. The air was clear. There was nothing between the two of them, but higher they went. It was as if that great red ball burning above called to him, drew him. Rico, Jojo tried again. Come back, you have gone too high. He felt it now, the heat of the sun on his own wings. He felt feathers come away as if the sun reached down with minuscule hands and plucked them out. Harder and harder, he beat his failing wings, with each stroke catching up with Rico. Further and higher, they flew towards the sun. The sun, which seemed now not just to shine down but to stare at them. Rico! And with that last shout, Rico's wings burst with a final puff of 
feathers and from far, far above what sounded to Jojo like a cry of laughter. As Jojo continued to shoot upward, Rico began to drop. Jojo's heart hammered, sweat coated him beneath his t-shirt. He had moments to think, moments till the two would meet. Could he just catch him on his back, catch him and piggyback him down? It was the only plan he had. Spreading his own ragged wings, Jojo stopped himself and began his own descent, slowly, not driving, downwards, letting himself begin to fall, watching over his shoulder for his plummeting brother, watching him as you'd watch a football, following its path, ready to catch it on a stretched foot. Only this was no football, while if you missed it, would carry its path onward to the next player or off for a throw in. This was his brother. If he could, Jojo would have reached up to wipe the tears which streamed from his eyes, but he could do nothing but strain forward to keep the limb from his brother in his eye line, to try with all his might to make their paths intersect nearly, nearly. Jojo spread his wings and tried to glide beneath Rico, missed him. Rico kept on falling. No! screamed Jojo. Rico! But there was nothing he could do, nothing. His own wings were shredded. He did not even think he could stop himself falling. Rico ahead and he behind. They fell. Back down to earth. The wind battered Jojo as he tumbled downwards, desperately trying to spot his brother through tear-streaked eyes. He was sure he could see a dark cloud below, but the sky had remained clear, blue as they had played about and flown upward. It could not be a cloud. Or could it? Could it? It was not just dark but speckled with color, green, brown and grey. It was not a cloud. Rico hit it, slowed then disappeared into a haze. Now Jojo did lift a hand or wing to wipe his eyes. The last of his feathers quickly pushed aside the tears. He opened his eyes and he too entered the cloud, which definitely wasn't a cloud. Tiny hands, thousands of them, grasped hold of Jojo. His clothes, his fingers, his feet, tiny, tiny hands attached to tiny arms and tiny bodies. The creatures which had risen to join them from the wild flowers were not insects, not at all. They were people. of some kind, far, far smaller than the fairy Aunt Ben. The one holding Jojo's collar, just in front of his eyes, was no bigger than a mouse, a minuscule person, dressed in grass green with the wings of dragonfly. Jojo did not stop falling, but he slowed as a thousand hands, pulled him upward, little faces strained, tiny voices sang out together. He slowed and slowed and he could see just below him his brother slowing too. Thank you, thank you, Jojo gasped at the tiny woman who strained at his collar and pulled upward. If she heard him, if she understood, she did not show it. The tiny people and his brother were not at all Jojo could see. The ground, the fields and their own cottage still approached quicker than he could have liked. Still, they slowed and still the world rose to reach them. Jojo could see exactly where they were heading. The barn which sat across the road from their grandparents' cottage. They were nearly upon the moss-covered corrugated floor and the roof. Jojo screamed as a thousand tiny hands let go and a thousand tiny people flew away, back to the safety of their meadow. There'd be no falling boys there to rescue. Jojo screamed as he and Rico crashed into the ancient roof. The roof crackled and broke. The pair tumbled finally onto a burst bale of old scratchy hay, and Jojo found himself staring upward at a blue sky through a hole almost exactly his size. Have fun, said a voice. Jojo did not turn to look at Aunt Pen, not right away. He tried to catch his breath. He lay still and breathed in deep, coughed and choked. He took his asthma pump from his pocket. He took a puff and another, grateful to his past self for not leaving it in his muddy pajamas. 
Finally, he turned to where the fairy, now just in the form of the old lady Aunt Pen, sat on dry and dusty bale of hay. Fun, he said, sitting up. Then he turned to his brother, who was sitting up beside him, shaking his head and grinning. That was amazing, Rico shouted. Amazing. But how did we? He didn't finish his question as Dojo, knowing his brother was safe, turned back to the fairy. Why didn't you stop us? Why didn't you save us? Stop you, Aunt Pen said. Do you think I'm in charge? In control? Not I. Save you? Sometime, Jojo Locke, you will have to do the saving. You will have to save your family. And besides, I saw the piskies come for you. Pixies, Jojo said. They were pixies? Piskies, Aunt Pen said. Piskies, not pixies. There are many of them in your world now, trying to see out the falling darkness. Even they, smallest of the seely, know that you are worth saving. And to your question, young Rico, how did you fly? Well, shall I tell him, Jojo, or would you like to? Piskies, Jojo muttered. There was more to see, more to find of this new world opening before him. More creatures like Aunt Ben, more wonders. I, I can't, Jojo said. Rico was standing now and brushing dust and hay, bits of roof and feathers from his pajamas. Tell me what? Jojo stayed sitting. He looked from Rico to Aunt Pen and then back again. She, he began. Aunt Pen, she's, well, yeah, said Rico, his little bro wrinkling. Aunt Pen is a fairy. And as he said it, the old lady with the wild white hair on the hay bale jumped down and her heap became a whirl of cloth and hair and wrinkled skin. And the person that landed was no longer the auntie, but the fairy in the pirate coat and hat. The dozens and dozens of bandoliers, sachets, packets, parcels and pendants across her chest jangled as she landed. Rico's mouth made a big elaborate oh what he said you are a fairy the wizened miniature pirate said amazing 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 i know replied aunt pen grinning her grin jojo shook his head and sighed can i make a wish then can i make a wish rico shouted leaping and shaking the last of the feathers from him no, said Jojo, as Aunt Pen said, well, but Jojo carried on the quickest. We can't just go making wishes. He is right, sort of. I do have certain limitations. There is a plan here, Aunt Pen tried to say, but Jojo went on over the top of her. She doesn't know what she is doing. She is dangerous. How dare you, said Aunt Pen. I'm not just any fair. But before she could further, Jojo said, she made mom sick when all I wished for. Well, you weren't very specific, see, said Aunt Pen. And I did make it happen. Mom has stayed one more day. Okay, okay. How about this? I wish mom could stop burping. Aunt Pen pursed her lips, thinking. She scratched her head. You can't just reverse magic like that. That is precisely the problem we have. Once they are out, things cannot simply be put back in the box. The pieces just won't fit anymore. They must be completed, ended, fulfilled. If I could, then I would. Aunt Pen opened her mouth in the fish-like way again, struggling with words which were unstable. I would, she tried again. Finally, she hugged. Some things I cannot speak of, but well, Aunt Pen fumbled at her necklaces, the little packages and bag pendants. Aha, she said and pulled one from the bunch. It looked for all the world like a maturized treasure chest. She took it in her long fingers, seeming to press it here, twisted there. There was a click at the top and it opened. Aunt Pen reached in with a finger and thumb. She caught something with a, here we go, she pulled and pulled and out popped a full size alarm clock, the sort with a bell on top. The sort that could not possibly have fitted inside that tiny pendant. Rico's mouth fell open. Oh man, he said, 
That was amazing. Aunt Pen nodded and grinned. I know, it rather was, wasn't it? Then she studied the clock. The thing about magic in this world is, it doesn't last all that long, like your wings. There's a time limit to these things and those verbs that have been inflicted at your wish, I might add again. She raised an eyebrow and a finger to Jojo. Should be stopping right about. But before she could finish, Who's in there? called a voice they all knew from outside. Granddad. Don't tell him. Jojo hissed at his brother. Why he wasn't sure, apart from he wondered, he still wondered if perhaps he was simply going mad. Don't tell him. Who's in there? You're trespassing. I'll call the police. Just stood and rushed to the door. It's us, Grandad. It's us. He pushed at the rickety wooden door. And there was Grandad standing in the light of the summer sun. What you doing in there? He said. Just playing, Rico said, appearing at Jojo's elbow. Just playing. Grandad pushed at the door, letting in more light. Jojo's heart skipped. Aunt Ben, he glanced back, but the fairy was nowhere to be seen. Well, said Grandad, I guess it is your barn. Our barn, Jojo said. Is that what I said? Grandad was shaking his head like he was trying to clear a foggy brain. Was your dad's, I think. He was gonna build a house before, before that sentence was not finished. Never finished. How did I not remember that? Grandad growled to himself. He shook his head again and turned back to the cottage. Come on, he said. Your mom seems to be all better. Thought we'd get fish and chips for lunch. Woohoo, said Rico. Best day ever, and hopped on after him. Jojo turned, looking back into the barn. There was an old red boat in there, away at the back in the gloom, which he had never seen before. Its sails stashed away. He stared at the faded redwood. He reached out to it as it seemed to reach to him. Then he shook himself, a fog of memories lost. He looked around the barn once more. No sign of Aunt Pen. Nothing. No sign of their adventure but for the holes in the roof and mess of debris on the dirt floor. No sign except one feather that clung to Jojo's sleeve. It was a big feather. White speckled with gold, it seemed to glow there in the sunlight. One feather. Jojo did not brush this away. He plucked it from his arm and held it up to the light. The sun shone down through it. Jojo stared at the sun and then looked back to the feather. His dad made her fly. That's what mum said. She remembered that at least. Jojo pocketed the feather. He'd need this feather. He did not know when or why, but he knew it. This feather was important. A first memory, a first feather. Something was happening here. Come on, Joy! Rico shouted. Jojo took one more look at the boat, then at the sun and followed his granddad and his brother. The rest of the day passed without any more happenings. Aunt Pen had up and vanished. No one except Jojo seemed to even notice though. Mum's burping had stopped, as the fairy had said it would, and they got fish and chips from something fishy in the village. Not as good if you are not on the beach, though, is it? said Grandma, as if she had forgotten that they didn't talk about the beach. Didn't go there and didn't talk about it, and Jojo knew why now. It was a special place. Dad's special place. He knew that like he knew that memory was not imagined. He had seen dad again. His vanished dad was reappearing, was breaking into Jojo's mind. He just didn't know why. He was desperate to ask questions, but too anxious about the sad blank faces he'd get as response. No one spoke for a long while until... The only use fresh from the sea at something fishy, though, said Grandad. Huh, said Rico fluttering potato across the table. Chips from the sea? Grandad shook his head. Jojo laughed. Fish, Rico, Mum said. Fish comes from the sea. Ah, yeah. 
I'm the best fish, Grandad went on. You get right here in door, of course. He would always complain of the fish in London, Mum said. She didn't look up from her fish and chips. Mum didn't say which he she was talking about. They all knew. Maybe Mum was remembering too. They ate quietly after that. Dad going missing had always seemed like something that had happened to someone else. Something in someone else's story. It was an idea of something that had happened. But now, now it was becoming real. Now it was becoming his story. Now he had a dad. The man who called him Buddy taught him to skim stones and bought a barn and liked fresh fish. Jojo had a real memory. Memories were erupting into their lives. But it was more than just memories. It was a person. He knew, he just knew that somewhere out there was a man who loved him. A real dad. But where? Lost? Gone? Where? Jojo looked at the faces around the table. Faces he loved. People he loved more than anything in this world. Yet he suddenly felt alone. Somehow he knew that whatever was going on with Aunt Pen and these reappearing memories, it was something he'd have to figure out alone. He wondered why these memories had returned now. What did it mean? What could he and his dad have to do with magic and the darkness hanging over Elfheim? Where did Aunt Pen figure in all this? Where was she now? And what was it that she couldn't tell him? This was surely just the start of the story. Sun and Moon The sun set over the village of Dor and the moon rose. Night was the land of the Sandman, and in the night he came. He moved as a shadow, edging round the poles of light which filled the main street near the station he stopped and set his pitch black eyes on a small house just off the main road he took specks of golden dust from that same bag attached to his belt he let them tickle across his palm did he inspect them muttering to himself or were those whispers for the specks themselves with a final word and a puff from the Sandman's lips, the specks lifted from his hand and began their spiraling journey. Up they went, following the cloaked figure's gaze, to the window of the house, which was lit with glow of a gentle night light. In they slipped through the narrowest of gaps, continuing their dance within. Its journey at an end, the dust fell on sleeping eyes the eyes of Mr. Terry Tanner, the town's taxi driver, and his wife, Regina, who ran a hair salon in Upford. And soon they dreamed, he of a brand new car, a large black one with big wheels, which he drove up to London and around the streets while everyone looked on, amazed. She dreamed of a holiday, of lying on a sunny beach. The Sandman had not tarried, he slid along the high street from dark to dark and then he stopped again. He stopped outside a glass-fronted shop. It read Clarks and Clarks in big gold littering. The Clarks had been the town's bookkeepers for as long as anyone could remember. Mr. Clark had taken over from his grandfather who had taken over from his grandfather and so on. Right now though, it was a young Miss Church Clark, 12 years old, that the Sandman was visiting. He took a pinch and puffed and made her dream of pulling on her football boots and playing for England in the World Cup final. Further on and further out of town, until the Sandman stopped at the cottage of the highest family, here he left dreams of outer space and flights among the stars for the eldest in the family, old Mr. Hyas, the dairy farmer. There were many dreams that night in Dor. Before the Sandman made his final stop in a field of wild flowers, 
overlooking the furthest flung cottage the locks married to the trotons the oldest of dor's old families the trotons had been visited by the sandman in dor for over 300 years is that what helping him looks like to you said the sandman at first it appeared he spoke to no one no sound but the gentle chatter of biskies and their own language which even the sandman could not understand nothing stirred beside a ripple in the wild flowers pink and yellow and white and the tall grass that surrounded him ben pero you are here the meadow rippled again seemed to shake itself and then a tiny figure rose from where she lay amongst the plants i am here ben pero said as you well know well said the sandman he had not turned to look at the fairy who was now seated on a rock beside him instead he stated and stared down the slope to the one story cottage where the lock boy slept their mother and grandparents too hm replied ben pero the boy has needed some shaking shaking said the man in black and you could be sure beneath that black cloak an eyebrow rose high in question your sister has done more than shaking your sister has wrought terrible magics your sister has broken the very contract that holds the worlds together ben pero finished i know this better than most i have seen it ben pero's mind went back to that gray and empty land where she had taken jojo everything has been lost to mab's madness even my sisters are gone lost and scattered even my own aud the oldest of us all the singer of the song is gone to who knows where i know what is at stake sandman ben pero's voice had risen grown to something fierce and with it had risen a cloud of biskies buzzing around her something fierce their chatter becomes a hiss of anger but then the fear yawned and the biskies dropped back down to their flower bed homes you grow tired the sad man said ben pero had ate since last they spoke her hair was wider her skin was wrinkled she sat at little less straight do you have enough in you enough fire left ben pero breathed in deep then sighed i am tired she said but i'm not yet a slave not like the boy i know i believe i know what i am doing he does not not yet but all the tire that is left and all the fire it is i will place in his charge soon he will see soon he will act the sandman stood soon he must he must see the path ahead if he is to find the lost lock he must see the way and he must walk it hurry ben pero ben pero did not stand to join him she dipped her head and sighed again all you see are the things that will be sandman master of dreams you underestimate the knowledge of what has come before to shape the present you must first understand the past but the sandman was gone memories whispered penpero that's what the boy needs he must know what he's lost before he knows what he wants mr good fellow the next day jojo rose late the rest of the house was in full swing grandad was back from his walk Grandma was watching her workout routine. She didn't actually do much the routine, but she liked to watch and move, even if just a little. And Trevor liked to watch Grandma. Mom had gone to work. There was a note beside him on his pillow. Jojo read it, still lying in bed. Sorry, Jojo, had to go early. Too much to do. So sorry, I can't be there. I tried to wake you, but you were fast asleep. Have a lovely day sweetheart I'll see you real soon Mom she had gone no proper goodbye the notebook shook a little in Jojo's hand he really was alone and then he read the final line Aunt Pen says she'll take you out exciting
exciting, exciting or terrifying. And where was Aunt Pen? Jojo sat up. He looked around the room. Rico's sleeping bag was empty. Where was Aunt Pen and where was Rico? No, no. He should have thought of this. He should have been up before Rico. He had to protect him. Who knew what wishes Aunt Pen could be granting at that very moment? Jojo dashed through the living room. Morning, Grandad said, looking over his newspaper. And one and two, Grandma said, slowly grating in time to work out routine. Morning, Jojo called over his shoulder as he burst into the kitchen. He got one look at a grinning Aunt Pen as Rico opened his mouth and said in a cheerful cheer up, I wish my dreams would come true. Jojo skidded to a halt, bumping the table, sending the salt shaker rocking and then rolling away. Oh no, Rico, what have you done? He said. Rico just grinned at his brother as Aunt Pen wriggled her nose and blinked. There it was, that flash of light and then nothing. Jojo held his breath. So, said Rico, what are we waiting for? Hmm, said Aunt Pen, looking at her hands which seemed to wrinkle and crease before their eyes, light brown spots appearing on the dark packing paper skin. What was happening to the fairy? Was she growing older? Did each wish age her just a little more? She looked up at Rico. You see, it's not an exact science, this magic, more an art form. Never sure exactly what might happen. She stuck a finger in her mouth plugged it out and thrust it in the air like she was testing the wind. Something is happening somewhere. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Jojo took a breath and sighed. Then, Rico, he said, looking crossly at his brother. Rico still grinned. Exciting, isn't it? This is gonna be amazing. This is, this is, Jojo, shaking his head. I told you she doesn't know what she is doing. You need to listen to me. This is gonna be terrible. Nope, said Rico simply, his five-year-old head bobbing in excitement. This is gonna be the best. But it was neither terrible nor the best. In fact, it was nothing at all. Nothing happened. Nothing happened at breakfast. Just a normal breakfast of cereal and mugs of tea this time. Nothing happened when the boys got themselves ready. Nothing happened when Grandad announced after watching another rerun of Mickey Max Family Game Show. I hear you boys are out with Aunt Pen today. I'm taking Trevor for a walk. Then I'll catch up with you later. And off he went. Even Georgia found himself somehow disappointed. He didn't want another burp fest and certainly not another fall from a great height. But then... Your fairy godmother cast a spell, you expect, well, something. So when Aunt Pen said, I hear there's a very good park here in door, Jojo and Rico both looked at each other with expectation glinting in their eyes. Is this it? said Rico, running to the hall, plucking a football from the box of outdoor stuff and pulling on his shoes. Jojo flowed and followed slowly. Yes, Aunt Pen said, this is our trip to the park. But is this it? said Rico. Shoes were on. Laces were tied. Aunt Pen was pulling on her dark red coat with the gold buttons, making sure all her pendants were in place. Never know what you might need, she muttered to herself. It is. I know it, said Rico. Ah, one more thing, I think, said Aunt Pen and headed back into the house. The two brothers listened and standing in the hall as Aunt Pen clattered around in the kitchen, bowels and tins bashing, crashing. What was she up to? Jojo and Rico looked at one another, then ran back to the kitchen. They pulled the door open. There she was, the fairy godmother twirling, worrying back and forth, pulling, throwing, tasting. She was a blur dashing from spot to spot. She was everywhere all at once. Flour flew in the air, sugar poured from a great height. Eggs were juggled and spun from one side to the other. Raisins seemed to fall like rain and bounce up from floor, 
like rubber balls. Through it all, you could hear Aunt Ben singing an indecipherable song of unknown words. Rico let out a laugh. Ha! And he was spinning on the spot, trying to take in the flurry of blurred cutlery, crockery, and cascading ingredients. And Aunt Ben didn't slow down until she stopped with a ping and closed the lid on a cake tin. Just thought we might need a cake, she said. Jojo and Rico's mouth fell open. They had made their fair share of mess in their time, but this was something else. Every surface was covered in pans and packets. Every spot of floor was sprinkled with flow raisin sugar. Globs of butter seemed to be stuck to the ceiling. Oh, don't worry about that, said Aunt Ben. Let's see, let's see, she said, feeling for another one of her necklaces. If we just... Then she found the one she was looking for, a pendant in the shame of a sort of purse. This is it. She flicked the tiny bag open and pulled out again something too big to fit inside. Something like the recorder that was currently back home on the chest of drawers in Rico and Jojo's room. The instrument Jojo had never practiced. Only this one was gnarled and wooden, like it had been grown on a plant rather than carved by hands. She put it to her lips and blew. From under her curled fingers, a tune escaped, short and commanding, like a call or command. Then she waited. What are we waiting for? Jojo said, we need to get this mess cleaned up. Hold on, Aunt Ben said, and waited some more with a finger in the air and eyebrow raised. Get the dustpan and brush Rico, said Jojo. But then, knock, knock, knock. There was a knocking somewhere, as if on a door. But this wasn't from back down the hallway at the front of the cottage. This was coming from somewhere in the kitchen. Knock, knock, knock. Then a voice. Hello, anybody there? A small voice, gruff and tiny, like a swarm of bees. Ah, here we go, said Aunt Ben, turning toward a high-up kitchen cupboard, where they kept the tins of tomatoes and jars of jam and other things of the sort. She pulled it open to reveal a tiny man seated on a pot of honey. His eyes were bright and twinkling like that of a young boy, but his face was aged and craggy like granddad's. He wore something like the clothing Jojo had seen, the fairy version of Aunt Pen in, only his were all browns and greys. He was smaller than the fairy, yet taller than the piskies. He was the height of a school ruler. Mr. Goodfellow, said Aunt Pen. Ooh, lovely bit of baking, said Grandma, who had entered the kitchen on silent slippered feet and was looking at the incredible mess with a small smile on her lips. At your service, said the tiny man. Good afternoon, he said, raising his little hat to Jojo. Hello, he said, winking at Rico. Charmed, he said, with a small bow to Grandma. You may call me Hob. What a delightful man, said Grandma. Are you here to check the matter? Jojo and Rico was lost in silence again. Very good, Mr. Goodfellow. Did you have far to come, said Aunt Ben. Not at all, not at all. Just servicing a rather nice house in Upford. All done. Speak and span as usual. Wonderful, said Aunt Ben. Well, just a little job here. Kitchen needs a tiny spruce. Jojo, with his mouth wide again, managed to say and shake himself back to life. A tiny spruce? This place is an absolute mess. How can this, this, I don't know. Are you a fairy too? How can he get all this sorted? I beg your pardon, said the tiny man, getting up from the house and honey jar. Looking back at it, then with one swift movement, sprighting it away inside his brown tunic. I am no such thing, you people. Think you know everything. You're nothing. I, as anyone in old Albion could tell you, am a goblin. Absolutely finest cleaners, sorters, neatners, declutterers, ship shape makers, odifiers, and organizers in all the world. Thank you very much. With this, he lifted his chin and turned to Aunt Ben. 
just the kitchen, fairy. Just the kitchen. Well, maybe you couldn't fix Mrs. Locke a little lunch, too. Ooh, wonderful, said Grandma. Cheese and toast, please. The goblin, Hob or Mr. Goodfellow, as Aunt Ben had called him, gave another little bow. I would be most honored to serve lunch to such a fine lady. If you would care to take a seat, Grandma bustled past the two boys, still crowded in the doorway. A delighted man, she said. Just delightful. The goblin leaped from the cupboard, flipped, twisted and landed with a roll amongst the flour and raisins on the floor. I'll begin here, I believe, he said, and proceeded to pull a large dustpan and brush from within his clothing. I'll take my payment where I find it, he added. Of course, of course, said Aunt Pen, pointing the boys out of the kitchen and snatching up the cake tin from the egg and butter smear table. Let's leave Mr. Goodfellow to it. We can't just, started Jojo. We can, said Aunt Pen as the door swung shut behind them. The kitchen, cried Jojo, will be spotless when we return, said Aunt Ben, as she hustled them into the hallway. But Grandma is in excellent hands. She'll have the best cheese on toast of her life. Goblins, as well as being excellent cleaners, happen to also be very fine chefs. And with that, Jojo, Rico, and Aunt Ben were out of the door and on the way to the park. That was awesome, said Rico. It rather was, wasn't it? Aunt Ben grinning her usual mischievous grin and heading out into the world. Lost in the Park The park was busy. There were little kids than Jojo all over the playground which looked out towards the hills around door, Rico, still clinging on to the football he had bought, ran off to climb the big knitting pyramid. Jojo scanned the light zipline climbing frame and settled on a sulky swing. Aunt Ben watched on from a bench like she was just an ordinary aunt, taking her nephews to the park. How could mum and granddad and grandma all believe that she was their godmother? even though they had never, never seen her before. Must be magic, bad magic. Maybe she wasn't here for good. Maybe she was here for bad. Jojo sat on the swing, his legs dangling, his face pointing away from the hills. He knew if he swung high, you could catch a sliver of the sea beyond the village. He didn't want to swing high though. He was too busy thinking. Aunt Ben seemed to be asleep on the bench, Rico had made some friends at the top of the pyramid. Rico was like that. They were seeing how high they could jump from it. Maybe Jojo should be taking advantage of this whole thing. If she was his fairy godmother, then what should he be wishing for? If Jojo would wish for anything, if he was going to pen Perro's magic, what would he wish for? Riches? Adventure? Finally, Jojo kicked off from the ground, swinging his legs back and forth. He was flying then, not really flying, not like the day before. He wondered, stirring up at the sky, falling back down to the ground again, and again, and again. If he should phone Mum to tell her about who Aunt Ben really was. But he knew, he just knew that it would sound even stranger over the phone, all this magical madness. Grandad? Maybe he should tell Grandad. What would he say? How would he even begin? Sky, swing, ground, swing. And would he believe him? Could he believe him? Ground, swing, sky, swing. Rico, ground, swing, Rico, sky. Jojo, Rico shouted. Let's play football. Jojo slowed and then jumped from the swing, not twisting and flipping like the little goblin, but still being rather pleased for this landing. Yes, said Rico, good one. Then as they walked towards Aunt Ben on her bench by the gate, it's not happening. You said something was happening. Where is my wish? Jojo had been thinking about this all the way to the park. Something was happening, Aunt Ben had said.
but nothing, not yet. I don't know, Rico, but maybe it's a good thing. I told you about the castle and the throne room and the, and the fairies, he said about it on the way to the park, with Aunt Pen chipping in corrections and alterations. He had told him about the flight through space and time, the thrones, the statues, the darkness. He had told him what he had wished for Mum to stay home and what Aunt Pen or the magic in her had done. Who knows what your wish will turn into? Who knows what dream she'll pick? What? Well, you said you want your dreams to come true. D you didn't say what dream. You've got to be specific, I think. You think? Oh, football, said Aunt Pen, rising from her bench. I love football. One of the best I am. They played football on the big field where the woodland started. You could walk that woodland all the way along the river which ran from upward to door. Jojo knew that because they had done it with Grandad. It was Grandad's favorite walk. He liked to walk from here to the fairy mounds, a clump of little hills on the edge of Upford, which legend said were the ancient homes of fairies. Each was stopped with a ring of stones bedded in the ground. Grandad was there a lot. He said they were important but could never say why. He just knew it. What had Aunt Ben said about fairy moons? They were the way into her world. You just needed to walk around them in a storm. Jojo would not be doing that in a hurry. The sight of the dark land filled his thoughts and filled him with fear. Especially the throne room. What did it mean? Why had they flown there? Why there? Why him? It seemed so unreal in the middle of the day in the park. Little did Jojo know. This was also the woodland where Dad had grown up. Building dens, climbing trees finding animal burrows and camping out at night to try to spot the creatures. Grandad had not told them, because Grandad, like Jojo, had a big empty space where his son should be. Aunt Pen fiddled around her necklaces and found one that impossibly contained a portable football goal. She pulled it out of a tiny pendant, like a magician, pulling out infinite handkerchiefs and swept it for the cake tin. Jojo kept looking round to check no one was watching. They didn't seem to be. Aunt Pen plonked the gold down in front of thick trees. And then they played. Aunt Pen really was rather good. She was a good bit better than Rico and Jojo at least. And Rico was good. Like really good. He was six years younger than Jojo but better than him already. Even Jojo knew that. Aunt Pen though was even better. They played knockouts. First, Aunt Pen beat Rico, dancing round him, slotting the ball through Jojo's legs into the goal. Then Aunt Pen beat Jojo with a mazy run around a family picnic. She flicked it over a dog and catching the ball on the volley sent it rocketing past Rico. A girl called Cherish asked to join them. She was small but whippet quick and older than Jojo. They made Aunt Pen go in goal. But even with three of them working together, they couldn't put anything past her. To Jojo, to Cherish, to Rico, back to Cherish, whack, dive, save. Cherish laughed. Your grandma's really good. She's not our, began Rico. She's our aunt, said Rico. Thank you very much, said Aunt Ben, bowing. As good as you may be one day, Cherish Clark. The girl blushed, gulped, and frowned all in one. Jojo looked from one to other. What did Aunt Ben know? He didn't ask. How much would Aunt Ben say if they let her? Come on, Jojo said. We can beat her. But they couldn't. It was strange to see this old lady leaping one way, sprinting the other, rolling, twisting, beating the ball away in her big skirt and necklaces and coat. People had stopped to watch, cheering as this old auntie flew around the park. Jojo, Rico and Cherish were gasping and sweating, but Aunt Ben was fresh as Daisy. Come on, you three, she shouted, after she had yeeted the ball halfway across the park. You gotta have more than that, Rico looked at Jojo. Penalties, he said. Jojo nodded. We are gonna take penalties, Rico shouted back to Aunt Pen, then trotted off to retrieve the ball. Right you are, she said. Rico took the first one, hard and fast toward the bottom corner. Aunt Pen dove and caught it in one curled hand. Cherish next. She tried the other corner, 
the same result. Jojo booted it straight down the middle. Aunt Ben punched it away with a growl of victory, then a laugh. National five aside champions we were, me and my sisters, a long time ago. Sisters? She had mentioned her sisters before, but it was now that Jojo thought how remarkable this was. She had her own family somewhere, a family of fairies. He wondered if they were close, if they got together for holidays and Christmas and stuff. Penalty after penalty, Aunt Pen just caught them or swatted them like they were flies. There were more cheers for the fairy godmother, and she enjoyed everyone. Raising her fist in the air, she grinned to the small crowd of picnickers and dog walkers and teenagers who had given up their game of frisbee. Rico had given up too and was sat in a little heap of boy of the goalpost. Right, said Cherish. This is it. She planted the ball on the spot. She took a big run up. The crowd started a slow clap, getting faster and faster as Cherish approached the ball. She swung and smacked it. It soared, spinning in an arc from the goalie toward the top right corner. It was going in. Surely this one, you have never seen a penalty like that. Jojo stood and stared. This was it. And then, like a cat, Aunt Ben pounced. Her arms seemed to stretch. Jojo could have sworn she gave a little nose wriggle. An imperceptible blink. Her hand shot out like a bullet. Her fingers clawed. One finger, the longest, grew a little longer and caught the ball at the very last moment, sending it spiraling past the post. The crowd groaned. No goal. Then cheered. What a save! Oh, come on, muttered Jojo. No goals and the ball was gone. Somewhere into the woods behind, Rico leaped up. I'll get it. And off he ran. Good effort, Aunt Ben called to Cherish. Oh, no, she said, her eyes on her watch. Oh, no, have you seen the time? I've got to go. Then she turned and ran. Sorry, she called over her shoulder. Sorry about the ball. If I've lost your ball, I'll replace it. Don't worry, Jojo said. Then half waved and walked over to where Aunt Ben stood in goal. Did you see where it went? Rico was shouting from the edge of the woods. I can't see it. Aunt Ben was grinning from ear to ear. I'm rather good, aren't I? Jojo stuck out his tongue and laughed. It must be around there, buddy. Right where you are, he called to Rico. Rico stepped further into the stand of trees, further in, further away from Aunt Ben and Jojo. The crowd had all left, returning to dogs and towels and their abandoned frisbee. Not bothering to watch a boy searching around for his lost ball. Nothing, shouted Rico. Hmm, mysterious, said Aunt Ben. Jojo took a puff on his inhaler and looked up at her. What have you done? Me? Me? I don't do anything, only what you ask. Your wish is my command, she said, looking down at Jojo, then doing a funny little bow. I can't see, shouted Rico, then silence. Aunt Ben and Jojo spun, their eyes searching the woods, leaping from tree to tree empty. No Rico, he was gone. What have you done, said Jojo again. What have you done? Then he was off, running towards the trees. Hold on, said Aunt Ben, and she was with him, running. If some other strange creature has got him, or if you have sent him off to some place, or if he's got some terrible illness too, Jojo didn't stop to say any of this to Aunt Ben. He just shouted it over his shoulder as they ran straight into the woods. He was around about there, said Aunt Ben. They crashed through the trees to the spot where he had been. He's not.